Hello everybody. Welcome to the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. We're an international non-profit association representing individuals and organizations involved in antibody related research and development. We provide a forum to facilitate discussion and interchange of ideas, to disseminate information, to provide guidance and to assist the training and advancement of students, postdoctoral fellows and others new to the field. If you care about antibodies, please do join the society. This is the first episode in a nine part series designed especially for early career biological scientists and research clinicians. We are going to have a close look at commercial research tool antibodies. The speakers will be presenting their independent expert conclusions correct to the best of our knowledge at the date on which this webcast is originally shown. We all learn about these commonly used biological reagents as undergraduates, so why on earth waste your time watching these talks? Antibodies may be straightforward to use, but they are not easy to validate. Validation involves demonstrating that an antibody reproducibly binds what it's predicted to bind to and not to something else in a particular experimental context, and that it is unequivocally what it is purported to be. In other words, you have to show that the antibody you're using is fit for purpose. As you will hear in the coming webcasts, if you are not very careful, badly validated antibodies can seriously mess up your career by giving spurious results that if reported will jeopardize your credibility and also corrupt the literature. In addition, it's a waste of usually public money, a waste of your time, and it's unethical. Of course, there are contraindications like if you don't validate, it's quick, you can get data, it's cheap, some journals don't check, and some reviewers don't notice. Our key opinion leaders from academic and industrial research will consider antibody validation and suggest how to avoid some most common pitfalls. We hope this will help you become extremely cautious when working with antibodies. Viewers of the broadcast can write in questions any time for the speakers to answer and they will remain online for 15 minutes after the cast has ended to answer any of the questions you might care to type in. A focus of this series will be the use of antibodies for analyzing proteins, though of course they have many other applications. We have to depend on antibodies often to isolate, identify, quantify and localize proteins in and from cells and tissues, and they are common tools in many cell biological techniques. That's because we lack the high sensitivity and resolution direct analysis tools that we have for nucleic acids, things like PCR, restriction enzymes, sequencing. Antibodies have evolved in vertebrates to recognize non-self from self, and they can distinguish between tiny differences in molecular structure. The question that interests us here is, what exactly is the specificity of a particular antibody? Or more exactly, what is the specificity and selectivity of a particular commercial antibody that you have purchased? Is it what's written on the label? Will it function in the experiment you plan to use it in? How will you verify that it's bound the target molecule as described? Come to that, how did you decide to buy this particular antibody? Is there a better one available? After all, there appear to be millions, literally millions of commercial tool antibodies on the market. Is each product actually a discrete individual antibody different from all the others? How can you tell? And what appropriate positive and negative controls can I use in my particular experiment? These are amongst the vexing topics that the experts invited by the society are going to cover in this series. But first, a quick run over the terminology. Most commercial tool antibodies are in an immunoglobulin G IgG format. They're two identical heterodimers connected by sulfidal bridges, so each IgG can bind two moles of its target, the antigen. In this series, we will mainly consider protein antigens. The antigen binding fragment of the antibodies bind via six variable regions, three on each of the heavy and light chains, the so-called complementary determining regions, or CDRs. The sequences in the CDRs are shuffled and mutated during antibody maturation in an animal to produce more than 10 to the 12 potential antibody binding specificities. The antibody arms can open or close via a hinge region to, match, to meet, reach out to more or less widely separated epitopes. 
approaching epitope is typically a surface some 2.5 to 4.5 nanometers in diameter but it can be a slot or a bulge in the anti in the target surface the epitope is the actual region of the antigen where the protein the antibody binds think of it as a footprint that the antibody leaves on the target it may be a linear or discontinuous amino acid sequence and it depends on the precise 3d shape and charge pattern at the surface the more snug the fit between the epitope and the antibody CDRs, the higher the binding affinity of the antibody, and this determines specificity for the epitope. An antibody can be highly specific for an epitope, yet if that epitope is present on many proteins, it is then poorly selective. This causes a lot of confusing results, and we will discuss it in detail later in this series. If you find it confusing, think of an antibody CDR as, as walking boots without the chirality. My feet are their targets, the epitopes. The boots fit me well, so they are highly specific, but they're poorly selective because they fit many people. They are fit for purpose. On the other hand, if an antibody is highly specific but poorly selective, you may well find that it's not fit for purpose, as we'll see later in this series. In this, the first episode, Professor Andreas Pluktun from the Department of Biochemistry, University of Zurich is going to ask, what's all the fuss? Antibody specificity, what's the problem? Greetings, Andreas. Thank you very much for joining us today. Andreas, could you tell us about the characteristics of typical tool antibodies that a user might purchase? Thanks very much, Simon. So this first webcast um, has been entitled Antibody Specificity. Yeah, what's the problem? And so let me start in the very beginning and uh, pick people up where they have been left from the textbook. Antibodies are known to be specific, so how can there be a problem? And the main reason lies in the very simple fact that most of them haven't been checked for specificity. So what will be the take home message from this episode is specificity cannot be just assumed, but it has to be experimentally verified. So let's go a little bit in more depth in what causes non-specific binding and what may even cause the absence of specific binding. Well, I mean, the, the root lies in physics. Protein surfaces always bind several things. This is how proteins are made and are, um, this is their properties in the body. The second thing we'll cover is that antigens can be in various conformations and they present different surfaces. And the third thing we'll cover is that the composition of an antibody solution may not be what you think it is. So let's just talk about a few fundamental problems of proteins. And that is that they bind one another. And this is illustrated on the left-hand side with the blue and the white protein, um, and with the blue peptide and the white protein. And these proteins, of course, recognize each other with very different affinities. And there are some hotter parts and some colder parts, but these are intrinsic properties of proteins, and this can be through adventitious hydrophobic patches, it can be through adventitious residues that can make hydrogen bonds, this is what proteins do. And since antibodies are proteins, they do this as well. They will cross-react with other proteins, in other words, antigens, that can be unrelated to the antigens that the antibody has been made for, albeit at very different affinities. So let me start with um, summarizing different types of antibodies. So everybody knows polyclonal antibodies. They're very popular because they're cheap and they're taken directly from the serum. So this is a mixture of antibodies that recognizes specific epitopes on the targets. And in this mixture, they can give very strong signals because they can take advantage of many epitopes and they can bind bivalently, in other words, with their two arms in many different orientations. So that's all good. The problem is there are always antibodies in this mixture 
which will cross-react with other components. In other words, here we see this blue component, which we don't like, um, is being recognized because it has this green epitope which it shares with um, some other, uh, with the, an epitope of the uh, antigen we do like. And there will always be antibodies in this uh, mixture that cross-reacts with other components. The second issue is the composition of two antisera will never be the same. And therefore, it is impossible to reproduce results from polyclonal sera. In other words, if an animal is immunized several times, the mixture of antibodies it generates will never be exactly the same. And so the type of antibodies that you find in the serum will change from time to time. So then, uh, from 1975 on, monoclonal antibodies have entered the scene. And they're popular because people believe that they're automatically super specific. Unfortunately, this is not true. They can also cross react with other proteins for very similar reasons, which we'll explain in a second. And they may even detect other proteins better than the desired target, and which will also come as a surprise to many. A monoclonal antibody is not necessarily monoclonal, which I'll explain in a few moments. So if we now look on the left-hand side to the binding side of an antibody, a monoclonal antibody shown in some more detail schematically, we see that it has sort of several sub pockets uh, drawn in different colors. And so if our desired antigen is the oval one on the top, um, we can see this would actually fit very well. And there may be some isoenzymes, for example, some related proteins which share the same antigens, and this is to be expected. These are closely related proteins, which of course will be also recognized if they share the same epitopes. And this is something which we call legitimate cross-reactivity. So this is all okay. The problem is that, of course, there are other species in the biological mixture which could be totally denatured and just share just a few of uh, residues that would bind to some of these sub pockets. These may be totally unrelated, not recognizable by sequence, but just happen to react with a part of the binding site of this antibody. They may be sticky, they may have only few epitopes, they're totally unrelated, and we might call this illegitimate cross-reactivity. And if it, this is not checked properly, the antibody may actually detect some of these other proteins better than the desired one. And the antibodies may change their binding site, they're somewhat mobile, and so therefore have even greater access to other um, epitopes of unrelated proteins. Now let me come to the third point that a monoclonal antibody may not even be monoclonal. In order to understand that, we have to briefly uh, remind ourselves how monoclonal antibodies are made. So if a mouse is immunized with an antigen, the spleen cells are isolated and they are fused with cancer cells, with myeloma cells, to fusion um, cells which are called hybridomas. And it has been found frequently that about one third of these hybridomas express more than one allele from these B cells. So the uh, allelic exclusion from the spleen cells doesn't actually work so well. Sometimes they even fuse more, are fused with more than one B cell. And the myeloma cells also um, express additional light chains. And so all of this together means that um, about a third of all hybridomas secrete more chains than one might think. In other words, more than just one heavy and one light chain. So in other words, the reality, unfortunately, is not quite as clean as the textbook may make it look. There's another problem, and that is as long as the sequence of the antibody has not been determined, 
you cannot know whether two antibodies, two monoclonal antibodies are the same. The reason is that manufacturers sell to each other, they just slap another label on, and so you think you're buying different antibodies, but you always buy the same antibody with a different label. Also, manufacturers, if they run out of a hybridoma, for example, if the cell dies, they produce a new lot, maybe with a different composition for the reasons we just went through. So you think you buy the same antibody, but you actually get a different one. And so again, it may be impossible to reproduce an experiment because of these issues. And so recombinant antibodies are one way of solving this problem. And if we go through the scheme on the left-hand side, we see that through immunization and DNA isolation, or even through synthetic libraries, and with some display technologies, selection for specificity, quality control, we can get an antibody with a known sequence. And this is something that will cover, be covered towards the end of these webcasts. And so in these cases, the sequence is known. And for this reason, the antibody can be reproduced forever. In other words, the antibody has become immortal. And so just to make that entirely clear, the quality control still has to be done as for every antibody as we have just discovered and discussed. So um, I think most experts would agree that these recombinant technologies are the future to get around the problems we have uh, discussed so far. To go one step further, uh, once these technologies are in place, we don't even need the antibody anymore. One can use synthetic DNA libraries uh, um, encoding other scaffolds, use the same display technologies, selection for specificity, quality control, and sequence determination. And um, again, um, such affinity reagents can be used that are much more stable than antibodies. Again, this is something that will be covered towards the end of these webcasts. And these can be produced more cheaply and again, I think most experts agree that these recombinant technologies on the whole um, are seen as the future. Now, let me now talk about antigens. So I think it's very important to understand that there is a fundamental distinction between a folded protein as an antigen and an unfolded protein. So the folded proteins are, of course, the ones that are found in the cell or on the cell surface. They're usually more soluble. And in contradistinction, the denatured or unfolded proteins tend to expose hydrophobic residues and thereby become more sticky. Usually for these reasons, they need to be kept in solution, either by detergent, for example, SDS, or by a denaturant, for example, urea, guanidine hydrochloride. And so the folded proteins are the ones you would want to recognize in cell extracts, for example, in pull-down assays, on the cell surface, for example, in FUX experiments, whereas the denatured proteins or unfolded proteins are the forms that you would want to detect after SDS gel actophoresis in other words, in Western blots, or after proteolytic digestion, or after tissue fixation. So, for example, in immunohistochemistry, where the antigen retrieval then uh, would liberate the protein, and this is done under very harsh conditions, typically with a microwave oven, so you can be assured that the protein is going to be pretty unfolded. So many conditions can denature a protein, and under these conditions, of course, antibodies that recognize the native state would no longer bind. So if the protein is treated with heat or even heavy shaking, in other words, foaming, or if ligands are lost or metal ions are lost or subunits are lost, the protein pretty easily converts into the unfolded protein and some of the antibodies that recognize the folded protein would no longer recognize it. 
And so we can clearly see there will be antibodies that recognize conformational epitopes that are present on the folded proteins, and they will only be accessible if the protein is in this state. And these antibodies will typically recognize residues that are on the surface, but they can be far apart in the sequence. Now, antibodies that recognize the unfolded proteins recognize so-called linear epitopes, which will only be accessible in the denatured protein or in a peptide digest, and these will recognize residues that are close in the sequence, and they may actually be hidden in the interior. And so we can immediately understand that the same protein expresses itself and exposes itself in very different form to antibodies. And so therefore, antibodies will typically recognize either the folded or the unfolded state, uh, recognizing a discontinuous epitope on the folded state and a continuous or linear epitope on the unfolded state. And most antibodies for these reasons can thus only be used for either Western blots or immunohistochemistry for unfolded state recognition or for facts or pull down assays if they recognize the native state. And so this is, I think, a nice illustration of such a case. This is uh, an antibody that recognizes folded lysozyme we can appreciate that it really recognizes the surface of this folded lysozyme uh, protein. And on the right-hand side, you see it in, a, in a, a CPK plot. And this is conversely an antibody that recognizes a peptide antigen. Uh, now we look towards the FAB fragment. The peptide antigen lies in a groove between the heavy and the light chain, and we can see how it really is stretched out there and the side chains go alternating with left and right. And just if we look at many antibodies, we see that indeed anti-protein antibodies, anti-native protein antibodies tend to be rather flat. Anti-peptide antibodies tend to have a groove and some of them even have a pocket for a big side chain, for example, a tryptophan that sticks into um, the uh, binding site between the heavy and the light chain. Okay, so quality controlling of antibodies is by definition application specific and this means of course that the antigen recognition must be checked in the state of the antigen that will be used later. And importantly, the cross-reactivity will also always depend on context. So what other denatured proteins are around, what other cell components are around, what other non-protein contaminants might be around that bind to the anti antibody. And this means, of course, there is no such objective measure or absolute measure of specificity, but it'll always be context dependent. I think this is important to, to realize. Now, let me just say a few words about two specific assays, one of them being ELISA, probably practiced by almost everybody. So ELISA is usually done by one component being bound to polystyrene. And for this, the protein, at least part of the protein, must denature, otherwise it wouldn't bind to polystyrene. And so small proteins will almost certainly denature under these conditions. Peptide won't bind um, because they wouldn't be hydrophobic enough normally. Or if they do, they wouldn't be recognizable because they are too small there. And of course, they can be biotinylated and then bound to immobilize streptavidin, for example. Now, with large proteins, it's often sufficient that one of the domains denatures and the rest remains folded. And this is actually also true for IgGs themselves, where it is sufficient that, for example, one de domain denatures and the IgG is then bound to plastic, but still exposes at least one of the binding sites to, um, bound, to have an um, antigen being immobilized this way. Immunohistochemistry is a special case um, where antigens are typically cross-linked, and so many epitopes are blocked. That's important to understand. 
and in order to make anything visible and uh, uh, that it can be bound, one needs to use a procedure which is often called antigen retrieval, and that means it's a heat denaturation of the antigen, so the antigen almost certainly looks very much like the structure on the right. And still, only a small subset of epitopes is suitable for immunohistochemistry because this antigen retrieval is never complete and also um, the structure is, is, as I said, a pretty denatured. And it's actually rather difficult to mimic this exact IHC conformation, if you will, in vitro um, and thus to test it outside an IHC experiment. So the bad news is that specificity in IHC probably has to be tested in IHC. Uh, to every rule there's an exception and there are a few antibodies that work both in several applications um, in the folded and unfolded proteins and, and, and this is true if they're made against a piece of the protein which is always unfolded, for example a termini of receptors that would be recognizable in western blots as well as in, for example, um, pull-down assays. Of course, in these particular cases, these termini are inside the cell, and so this would not work, uh, for example, in facts. It would also work with polyclonal antibodies because there would most likely be a mixture of antibodies recognizing folded and unfolded proteins, but of course, as we have discussed in the beginning, this comes at a very high price of cross-reactivities that are almost impossible to control. And so that brings me to the summary. Um, what I wanted to discuss here is that cross-reactivity of antibodies is to be expected. It's a part of physics. And since this is to be expected, it must be checked and controlled and be made sure that this doesn't interfere with the assays. The second point I wanted to make is monoclonal antibodies are not specific by definition. This is, a, this is a myth. They must be checked just as well. The third point I wanted to make is cross-reactivity is application specific. We have talked about folded and unfolded states and the different assays and the different um, contaminants that are to be expected for, and so this has to be tested under the application-specific conditions. The fourth point I wanted to make is that recombinant antibodies are defined, identifiable, and distinguishable by their sequence. And this is unlike conventional monoclonal antibodies, whose sequence is not known, usually not known to the manufacturer and not known to the customer. Having said this, recombinant antibodies must, of course, undergo the same checks for cross-reactivity as everything else. And these are, I think, the main points I wanted to make. And at this, I just wanted to thank you for your attention and, um, and thank Simon for organizing this. That's brilliant, Andreas. Thank you very much indeed. So, as you've heard, even the potential specificities and selectivities of antibodies found in commercial catalogues is variable based on how they're generated, whether polyclonal, monoclonal or recombinant. In addition, if you use a polyclonal or even a monoclonal, you may not be able to get the same reagent again. In other words, there may be problems of reproducing somebody else's work using such an antibody because it's not necessarily the same antibody that once it was. These issues of scientific reproducibility and the effects that commercial antibodies have on it will be the theme of our next webcast. Well, we'll welcome Glenn Begley and Cecilia Williams. This is the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. Thank you very much for joining us and bye bye until next time. Professor Plugtoon will be online for the next 15 minutes and will be very happy to answer any questions you care to text in. This series will be impossible without the generous financial support of our corporate sponsors, as shown on this slide. Until next time, thank you.